interval of instruction. And we'll talk about what is an interval of instruction here in just a moment. It's measurable, it's the long-term academic target written by an individual teacher or a teacher team. So why implement student learning objectives? Well, as we just discussed, student learning objectives are one of the options for teachers that have LEA measures if a district decides to use those in their student growth measures plan. They reinforce promising teacher practice and connect teacher practice to student learning. They can be used in all subject areas and content areas, so they're very versatile. They're adaptable. They definitely encourage collaboration, which is why we're here today, collaborating as science teachers. And this last part is very important to note, too. They provide teachers with some ownership of how they are evaluated. There is an SLO evaluation cycle. You start with the development process, which would begin in the fall. And again, these um, handouts, this is just part of the PowerPoint. It's a continuation of the PowerPoint. We have the development process, which begins in the fall. And then your SLO will get approved, and your district should be forming a committee. ODE recommends repurposing an existing committee if you have one that can be repurposed <coughs> for the um, intent of approving SLOs. ODE recommends that you um, have your SLO submitted somewhere between the middle of October, no later than the end of November. But again, your district will set that deadline and tell you who to turn it into, what date it needs to be turned in by. But all SLOs do have to be approved locally. And the State Department will not be approving SLOs. It's recommended that you have a mid-course check-in. That's not required, but it is recommended. And then you would have a final review of the SLO attainment and scoring. And then a discussion of the summative rating and impact on practice. And I will repeat this several times today and tomorrow, but just to get started on it. Even though the school year typically ends the end of May, beginning of June, depending on your school calendar, because the teacher evaluation timeline is now May the 1st, evaluations have to be completed with a written report by May the 10th. Your student learning objective, that has to be completed by the middle of April in order for your evaluator or whoever in your district will be entering data into that electronic system to get it in by May the 1st. ODE recommends a timeline of April the 15th. But again, your district will set that date and let you know when it has to be turned in by. So just to review, this is just another way of looking at that information from the cycle. This is the SLO development process. The first step is that you would gather and review available data, which we will look at the template and the checklist next, and that will explain in further detail what this looks like. You would determine the interval of instruction, meaning how long do you teach that course, and identify the content. What content do you teach during that duration? You would choose assessments and set the growth target. All students in your class will have a growth target. You would submit your student learning objective and prepare for approval and review. And then the last step, which would occur at the end of the interval instruction, which if it's a year-long class, that will be sometime in April. If it's a semester, like first semester, it would be at the end of first semester. You would score the SLO, which again, we will talk, take a look at that later today and tomorrow. Okay, you have this handout in your packet. This is the template. There are two required forms, and this is one of them. So I'm going to suggest that you keep this template and also this checklist in front of you. The template is what you will write on to create your SLO, and the checklist is what you will use to self-assess and it's also the instrument that your evaluator or the committee will use to determine approval of your SLO. I'm going to move over here so that you can see I have a poster of the checklist. It's a little uh, easier for me to look at too. But the first thing, if you note on the template, is that you'll see you put your teacher name. You put your um, course and your grade level in the academic year. 
So for today, we would put next school year, 2013-14. And you'll notice that there are seven components of the student learning objective. And again, this form cannot be modified. It's required. So that way the process is standardized across the state. The first thing is the baseline and the trend data. And you'll notice there's an overarching question. And that same question is also repeated on the checklist. And what it says is what information is being used to inform the creation of the student learning objective and establish the amount of growth that should take place within the time period. And if we look further down on the checklist, we know that there are three boxes we need to be able to check off. So when you start to write your student learning objective on the template, you will use the checklist to determine what kinds of information you'll place in that box. So the first thing is we have to identify sources of information about our students. For instance, test scores from prior years, results of pre-assessments. This is where you're going to get your baseline data. So if you have a post-assessment from the year before that you've given because you've had these children consecutively, or maybe the teacher before you has given a post-assessment, maybe there was an OAA that you could look at, maybe there was a vendor assessment that was being used, and the first year out, there may not be much for you to look at because the system has not been in place and maybe these um, assessments have not been occurring in your school district. Over time, it's anticipated that you'll have this kind of data available. However, you can do a pre-assessment at the beginning of the year that would cover the content that you would um, cover during that interval of instruction. And you could use that as your baseline. It's not required that you do a pre-assessment if you have post-assessments from the end of the year. But if you don't, for certain you want to use a pre-assessment. And you can use both. The more data points that you can put together to determine that student's level, the better um, you will be in determining their growth targets that we'll talk about here in a moment. The next thing is you're going to draw upon trend data if you have that available. And trend data basically means data that you have available over time. So if you're familiar with your local report card, for instance, it always shows the last three years of fourth through eighth grade reading scores, um, math scores, for the five and eight science scores, the OGT scores, and it'll do bar graph. So if you have assessments that are in place in your district that have been in place and you can look at trend data, maybe you can look at trend data on that cohort of students, the group that you're going to be instructing, Maybe you don't have the trend data on that particular cohort, but maybe you have trend data on 8th grade science. And you know that every, you know, the last three years of 8th graders that have come in, they've consistently been strong in this, and they've consistently been weak in this. So you can look at trend data based on the cohort, or just on that particular course in general. And then the last thing is, after you've collected that data, the baseline data and trend data, if you have it available, you're going to analyze it. And you're going to analyze students' strengths and weaknesses. What areas are they strong in? What areas are they weak in? And we will look at an example here in just a moment after I go through the checklist to just kind of get you familiar with the pieces of information that are included. The next column we have is student population. And if we go back to the template, we see we have student population and we have the overarching question, which is also replicated on the checklist. Which students will be included in this SLO? Include your course, grade level, and number of students. So on the template, and if you look at the checklist, we have the first box that says includes all students in the class covered by the SLO. So for instance, if I have um, 26 students in my class, if I am a third grade teacher, I would put all 26 students in my third grade class are covered in this SLO. Now some of you, a lot of you are middle school teachers in here, and maybe you teach three periods a day of seventh grade science. So instead of writing one for each period that you teach seventh grade science, you would include all your students from seventh grade science. So if you teach seventh grade science periods one, two, and five, for instance, you would just simply write, my SLO includes all, and if it's 76 students in those three periods, all 76 students of seventh grade science that I teach periods one, two, and five. Okay? So you do not have to write a separate SLO for each class period if it's all the same course. The next thing is you would describe any contextual factors that may impact student growth. 
So for instance, if you have students on an IEP, students that um, receive Title I services, students that are gifted, that are on a WEP, uh, anything that may impact student growth, you would note that on your student learning objective in this section. And you're not going to include student names. You might just simply say, I have three students on an IEP that receive extended time and other accommodations and modifications per their IEPs. You know, I have two students on a WEP, um, whatever the case may be. So any contextual factors that may impact student growth, you would include it in your student population. And the last thing is very important too, that you do not exclude any students um, that may have difficulty meeting the growth target. So something I recommend to teachers when they write these is just write a simple state statement. No students have been excluded from my SLO. And then that way, whoever is evaluating your student learning objective knows that you haven't excluded anyone. However, if for some reason there's an extreme circumstance, for instance, if you're a physical education teacher and you have a student who maybe is a paraplegic and for obvious reasons cannot participate in physical education and you don't have adaptive PE, possibly that student would be excluded. That would be a very rare circumstance and you would need principal approval um, in order to have them excluded. So that's why that checkbox is on the checklist because they do not want anyone excluded from your SLO. So unless you've gotten approval from the principal, make sure you have a statement that says all students are covered in my SLO. Okay, our next category is interval of instruction. And again, the same question that's on the template is also on our checklist. What is the duration of the course that the SLO will cover? Include beginning and end dates. And we just have one box to check off. And that is that we match the length of the course, for instance, quarter, semester, and year. So as I mentioned before, if I am teaching a full year course, for instance, I teach third grade, third grade goes all year. My SLO is going to be from September of 2013 and it will end April of 2014 to meet that new teacher evaluation timeline. If I teach a semester course, if I'm first semester, then it would be September through January or whenever first semester ends. If it's second semester, it would be January through April. The end date can not go beyond the middle of April. One of the things that is not on the checklist, but that we are seeing when we look at exemplars that Ohio Department of Education is starting to release, is that teachers are also including the number of minutes and the number of days that they teach their course. And that's just because when you submit this for approval, that approval committee in your district, the people on the committee may or may not have knowledge of your particular course. So when you write this, you're not only writing it for yourself to make sure that you have covered everything and engaging in best practice, but you're also painting a picture for that person or persons that are evaluating your student learning objective. So I would strongly encourage that you write the number of minutes and the number of days that you instruct that course. In particular, for those of you that might only see your students once every few days or maybe just um, every other week or however that may be. I know with Science Lab and things like that, sometimes districts have rotating schedules by quarter and semester for that type of situation. Okay, our next area is standards and content. And again, the same overarching question that's on the template is on our checklist. What content will the SLO target? To what related standards is the SLO aligned? So our first box is we have to specify how the SLO um, will address applicable standards. And we always start with, if we have common core standards, and that would be for English, language, arts, and math, that we've aligned it to that. You, you are science teachers, so you will fall under the Ohio Academic Content Standards, which are now the Ohio Learning Standards. And if we get the next generation science standards adopted in the future, then that would apply. But for today, you would fall under the Ohio um, Learning Standards. And if for some reason your course did not have national standards, or the Common Core standards, or the Ohio Learning Standards, then you would use national standards that are put forth by education organizations. So again, the first box is you're going to explain how your SLO aligns to the Ohio Learning Standards for Science. 
The next item is you're going to take those standards then and you're going to represent what are those big ideas that you are going to cover within that interval of instruction. So if you have a year-long course, September through April, what are the big ideas that you cover in eighth grade science? And again, we'll take a look at some examples that might help solidify this for you. And the last thing is, what's the core knowledge and skills that students are expected to attain? So you start off with the standards, you break those down into the big ideas and domains, and from there, what skills and core knowledge are the students expected to attain by the time they leave your course? So that's all the information that you'll put under standards and content. The next section is assessments, and again, our question is repeated on the template and the checklist. What assessments will we use to measure student growth for this SLO? And the first thing we have to do is identify assessments that have been reviewed by content experts to effectively measure course content and reliably measure student learning as intended. And I will tell you that this is a work in progress, the assessments. Um, there is guidance on selecting assessments, which Judy will go over that this afternoon. We also have a separate day, June 6th and 7th, designated to go through assessments. But ODE recommends that teachers do not individually go back and write their own assessments. Many of you in the room may not have a commercially available assessment. You may not have a state assessment. You're, if you're writing a student learning objective, um, you likely don't have a state assessment, and that's why you're here today. So you might be having to create your own assessment. They do not want individual, individual teachers creating their own assessments. It's encouraged that you would create them collaboratively, either in your district as a team, or if you don't have a team in your district, maybe you're a singleton, then maybe we would try to connect you with others in the county and write them collaboratively. And then have someone who is um, familiar, an expert in that field, review the assessment. So maybe that's where someone from Ohio State Lima or Bluffton University or whatnot um, could be involved and review these assessments. The next thing that we want to make sure is that those assessments have enough stretch. Again, um, this would be a separate professional development, but stretch would mean that you have enough items on the test that your low achieving students and your high achieving students can show growth. So again, we would look at Bloom's taxonomy, things of that nature, making sure that um, the test has enough stretch. And the third thing would be that you would have a plan for combining assessments if you use multiple assessments. So let's say that you decide to do a paper pencil assessment worth 50 points. Multiple choice, short answer, center response. You also decide that you're going to do a performance based assessment. Maybe your students are going to create something and you have a rubric that's been district created and district approved. Then you need to have a plan for how are you going to combine those assessments into one raw score. And tomorrow, when we look at how the SLO is scored, you'll see why that's important that we have one raw score. But if you do decide to have multiple assessments, you need to have a plan included in your SLO for how those assessments are going to be combined. And last but not least, you need to follow the guidelines for appropriate assessments, which again, ODE has issued a guidebook on selecting assessments, which Judy will go over this afternoon. And so those guides, making sure that it's valid and reliable, it has enough stretch, it covers the content that's covered in your course, all those things would um, be following the appropriate guidelines. Okay, our next section is growth targets. And under this section, we have to consider all of our available data, meaning we go back to the baseline and the trend data. We look to see where were our students before they came to us, where are they now that they are with us, um, how, do, how have students who have been in this course in the past performed? We take all of that information and we look to see um, what growth can students be expected to reach. So maybe if you've taught your course for multiple years and maybe you've given a post-assessment every year and as this evolves over time, hopefully you'll be more comfortable in setting these growth targets. But basically you're going to take all that data and you're going to determine, okay, a student that is at this level at the beginning of my course, what level can I expect them to be at the end of the interval of instruction? So you have to ensure, number one, that all students in the course have a growth target. Every student will have a growth target. Every student will have a baseline. Every student will have a growth target. The next thing is that we're going to use the baseline or the pretest data to determine the appropriate growth. The third thing is that we're going to set developmentally appropriate targets. 
So again, that's why we need to know those contextual factors. What does my classroom look like? Who's in my room this year? Um, taking all that into consideration. We're going to create tiered targets when appropriate so that all students may demonstrate growth. And for the most part, everyone will write tiered targets. And tiered targets basically means I would take all my data and my student scores. And so for instance, if I give a pretest and I rank all of my student scores, so for instance, let's say that my lowest performing student is a 20, my highest performing student is a 95, and I rank order all of my scores. I'm going to set tiers. No more than five, no less than three, but I'm going to group my scores in tiers. So maybe the zero to 40 range is a tier. Maybe I have a range of 41 to 50 as a tier. Maybe I have 51 to 60 as another tier. And so students that fall in those score ranges, I'm going to determine how much growth can I expect them to make. So maybe if they're in the zero to 40 range, I determine they need to be at least at a 70 in the, at the end of my interval instruction because in my district, 70 is the minimal passing rate. So if a student gets a 32, for instance, on their baseline data, they would be in the 0 to 40 range, which means that they would have to be at a 70 at the end of my interval of instruction, and that's called their growth target. That's why every student has to have a growth target, every student has to have baseline data. And then the last thing under growth targets is that you would have ambitious yet attainable targets. So again, this is where collaborating with your peers in your district, and if you don't have peers in your district, peers in the county, to determine what would be ambitious for my students, but yet attainable. And then our last category pretty much sums up everything you've already written about your student learning objective. And this is the rationale for growth targets. And the overarching question is, what is your rationale for setting the growth targets for student growth within the interval of instruction? So the first thing is you're going to demonstrate your knowledge of the students and the content. You've pretty much already covered that when you talked about your student population, you talked about standards and assessment. So you're going to just pull from those pieces of information and demonstrate your knowledge of students and the content. You're going to explain why the target is appropriate for your population, which again, when we look at student population and you look at their baseline data where they started, where they came from, you're going to use that information for that second item. The third item is addressing observed student needs. So again, when we look at student population and we talk about those contextual factors, I have gifted students in my room, I have students on IEP, maybe I have someone who's limited English proficient. I look at their data. I'm addressing their student needs through my student learning objective because possibly I've adjusted their growth target accordingly. Using data to identify student needs and determine appropriate growth targets, again, that goes back to that first box on baseline and trend data. The fifth box we have not really mentioned at all in the SLO, so this will be something that you'll need to um, look at in a more broader sense, because you're going to explain how your target aligns with broader school and district goals. So for instance, if your district is in the Ohio improvement process and you have a goal to increase reading and math by a certain percent each year. Maybe you could tie that in with your student learning objective. Or maybe your district or school has a goal of um, increasing performance-based assessments, and so you're going to include a performance-based assessment in your SLO. Whatever that goal may be, you'll want to include that in your student learning objective in this column. And then the very last thing that we need to include is setting rigorous expectations for students and teachers. And again, that will all be reflected throughout your student learning objective. So that is the checklist, which is the companion to the template. And again, these are required forms. The template you would use to write your student learning objective. The checklist you will self-assess and make sure you've included everything on the checklist. When the committee or the evaluator evaluates your SLO, if any box is not checked on the checklist, the SLO comes back to you, and it's recommended that your district give you 10 days to get that turned back in. So that's why it's important that from the beginning you understand each component of the checklist. That's why I wanted to spend time just giving you an overview before we look at examples. So that you can see all the components that go into creating an SLO. And look at those 
seven components and critically review the SLO example. And then if you have any questions about any of the components, I'm going to put post your paper up and you can put your questions underneath the corresponding area of the template. So again, that's a question that I would um, ask your district 
if they're going to expect you to cover everything within September to April on your SLO, or can you just include the content that you would normally teach September through April? That makes sense? So it's a local decision? At this point, I would say it's a local decision. ODE um, has put some guidance out there, but I would just clarify with your school district about that. Good question, but I would, I would clarify with them. I don't want to say one way or the other because some people may say yes, some people may say no. Other questions before we move on? Okay, the choir sample, this is what's considered an exemplar. And so hopefully by reading the choir example, even though I realize you don't teach choir, this is the example that ODA has given us to use in training um, sessions. But hopefully you can extract information from here and kind of see how an SLO flows, how you take that template and the checklist and put them together to write an SLO. And some things that I would like to highlight to you that I think are key words, and I would encourage you to either underline or highlight these words, when you create your SLO tomorrow. In the first paragraph, um, the teacher talks about entire years and um, basically kind of things that she's done in the past. The meat of it really begins in the second paragraph where she says that given the lack of baseline data, she administered a pre-assessment. And I think that's important. If you don't have baseline data, you need to state that. So that way there's not an assumption made that you just didn't put forth the effort to go looking for it. If there is no baseline data the first year out, then state that. <coughs> now, obviously, over the course of a few years, there's going to be baseline data, so you will be expected to include that. But beginning this coming year, if your district is implementing SLOs, and as a side note, if your district is not implementing the evaluation system this year, I would encourage you to pilot an SLO for yourself. Something that you just do on your own, so that way, if you need to make modifications to it before you turn it in the following year or whenever your implementation year is, you've had the opportunity to refine things. The teacher then goes on to talk about the pre-assessment and that it consists of two parts, a performance rubric and um, a music theory problem solving session containing short answer questions. And that's important because what the teacher is doing is giving us a picture of what does the pre-assessment look like. So rather than just saying, I gave a pre-assessment, I'm explaining my pre-assessment has two parts. And then she delineates how many points are getting attributed to each section. So again, it's very important to know why you're giving the pre-assessment, what the pre-assessment looks like. If it's 50 multiple choice, then write 50 multiple choice. Um, if it's too short answer, five extended response, write that down. The next thing is that it was district developed. And so I underlined on my paper the words district developed. Because again, ODE does not want any teacher going back and individually creating their own assessment. So you want to write district developed, if it was district developed, or team created, or county created. However that assessment was created, you want to state that. If it's a commercial assessment that you purchased somewhere, maybe it came with your textbook, state that. And it was created in collaboration with all high school music teachers in the district. And again, I underline the word collaboration. That's another key word. Because what they're saying is that many souls just didn't go back and write our own tests, close the door, write my own SLO, get my own tests, and so forth. I I'm being very transparent in what I'm doing. And then in parentheses, the teacher states that trend data are not available. And again, that sentence is important to state if you don't have any available. Because as I mentioned previously, that checklist, if there's any box that's not checked off, you get the SLO back to have to revise. So if you don't have trend data, and that's one of the items on the checklist, then you need to make that statement that trend data are not available. Okay, so from there, the teacher goes on to give us a table of the results. So you might want to make a note of create a table. Or some sort of uh, graphic of your results. So she gives us the pre-test results. 
And since her pretest was two parts, we have two tables to look at. One on the distribution of scores on the performance rubric, and one on the distribution of scores on the music theory and problem solving section. And you'll note that she's tiered her scores. Remember when we talked about tiering your scores? You take all your scores, you rank order them, and put them into tiers. So she has the score range of 0 to 10. There were three students that received in the 0 to 10 range, 11 to 20 range, and so on. And then she does the same distribution of scores for the music theory and problem solving section. And one other thing to note on these two tables is that she tells us how many points the first is worth, which is 40 points, and then the second section is worth 60 points. So when we combine those together and we turn over to the next page, we see she's now can put it on a 100 point scale and tell us the number of students is scored in the tiered ranges. What, what if you do this and you get, this is kind of a nice distribution, the example is, but what if you come up with everybody at the very top and nobody at the bottom one? And we're not test makers. We don't distribute them. We don't have all that research. We give a test and everybody's in the top two or everybody's in the bottom two. I mean, we don't have this nice distribution like they have here. Exactly. And that's a concern of many teachers that have come through the SLO training is that um, one of my students scores because I'm giving a pre-assessment on information that most of them, especially if you teach a course that, like Spanish one, and they've never even had Spanish before, or any exploratory language course, we're not expecting them to fare well on that. So that's a common concern. Um, I think the thing that is really important is just that you are collecting the data and that your assessments that you're using have been created by your district or team the pre-assessment results um, are going to be important information, but really that's why that baseline data that you can get that from last year's post-assessment or last year's OAA results or your trend data, that's where that information is going to really help you determine the baseline score that's used because you could very well have students that are really, really high end or very low end. So again, that's definitely been brought up many, many times. Okay. And then at the very end, the teacher basically is answering that last question on the, the um, checklist. This is where we have to talk about student strengths and weaknesses. So the teacher says um, distribution of scores shows that most students struggle more with music theory than they do with performances. Students display effort and are comfortable with ensemble singing, but they can strengthen their skills in interpretation and pitch. So again, you don't have to go to great length about talking about student strengths and weaknesses, but in order to have that criteria met on your checklist, you do need to take a look at your data, analyze it, and state what the student strengths and weaknesses are. Okay, just a few things under student population. Um, what I liked about what this teacher did was she not only told us the number of students, but she also told us how many students she had at SU at each level. Because if for some reason you do teach a course that has maybe seventh and eighth graders in it or um, mixed age groupings, you know, she tells us how many were freshmen, how many are sophomores, etc. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was relevant, and it may or may not apply to your courses that you teach, is that um, many of these students are joining choir for the first time so they do not need to audition. Uh, students have a lower background knowledge and skill in vocal music. So if your course might be an entry level course that you're teaching, that might be something you want to note because obviously the expectations for an entry level course are going to be different than a course that there's been you know, two or three prerequisites for them to get into. Interval of instruction, again, pretty much what we've already talked about. This is a semester, she includes the date she tells us that they meet every day for 40 minutes. And then she also puts down information about the evening rehearsals and several out of uh, school time performances throughout the year. So again, if you do like Science Olympiad or other things that um, may require additional time that you do with your students or whatnot, you might want to put that on your SLO if you think that that would enhance your SLO. Standards and content. 
Again, we have to make sure that it aligns to either the Common Core standards, the Ohio standards, or a set of national standards. And so in this situation, they align to the Ohio 2012 revised standards. Now this teacher did state different content statements, and the thing about the SLO process is that to begin with, it's required that your SLO, the first SLO you write, has to be what's called a broad SLO. So it has to cover all the broad concepts and skills. You can't just pick a couple of isolated content statements and write an SLO. That would be called a targeted SLO. You have to have a broad one before you can write a targeted one, and we'll talk about that later, Matt, at this point. Your district may allow you to just write a statement that says, my SLO aligns to the 2010 Ohio Learning Standards for Science. Please see attached standards. That's a local decision. If they'll allow you to do that, I have seen that in some of the SLO examples. This teacher wrote them all out. So again, you might want to ask your district, is that going to be acceptable to just say, my SLO aligns with the Ohio Learning Standards for Science? Please see attached. If not, you can follow what this teacher has done. Okay, underneath assessments, again, some of the key words that you want to make sure you include. She says, I will use a district-created post-assessment. District-created is key. Underline that word. Very important because, again, we don't want anyone assuming that you wrote it personally. It's been created by the district team. So I, under I underline created by a district team. And approved for use in SLOs. And I underline approved for use in SLOs. And the reason I did that is because ODD recommends that each school district have an approved list of assessments, which would mean that they would have that list in place before you start writing your SLOs in the fall. My guess is there's probably going to, it's going to be a work in progress um, at this point. But that's recommended simply because if for some reason there's any question about the assessment you're using, you know, you don't want to like write your SLO, give an assessment, collect all this data, turn it in the middle of October, and then find out that, geez, my assessment that I used wasn't approved. So now I have to redo the whole thing. So um, that's why they recommend that districts have an approved list of assessments. And then the teacher goes on to say that it's aligned to the content, valid and reliable, and contains stretch. And I underline those three things because those three things will get my box checked off underneath assessments where it says follows the guidelines for assessments. Because those are the guidelines. Your assessment has to be valid and reliable, aligned to the content, and contain stretch. The assessment is structured as follows and will can be combined for a final score of 100 points. So again, if I'm going to use multiple assessments, we know from the checklist that you have to have a plan on how you combine scores. So right here's her plan. She tells us, combine for a final score of 100 points, and then she tells us the 60% and the 40%, and she gives an explanation of how those are weighted. So, if you're planning to use more than one, I would follow her format. And this last paragraph, I think, is especially important, because she says that the performance assessments will be graded using a district-created rubric. So, underlying district-created rubric. Because again, if you're doing something that's performance-based, like maybe you have your students, especially in science, you do a lot of hands-on, maybe the students create projects, you use a rubric to evaluate their performance on that product or that project, you need to have a district-created rubric that everybody is, um, has calibrated and so forth and that everyone's agreed to. This is the performance level for level one, level two, however you set it up, basic, limited, proficient, whatever your ratings are on your rubric, that your team has agreed upon those levels. And then she says that all music teachers in the district have been trained on the rubric. And again, this is so key, attended a calibration session. So calibration is important as well, because just like I mentioned when we looked at the OTES rubric, even though there are going to be thousands of evaluators in the state of Ohio evaluating teachers on that performance rating rubric, every, every evaluator has to be credentialed because they want to have things calibrated so that way if I go in and observe a teacher or Judy goes in and observes a teacher, we have the same
same mindset of what it is we're looking for. We have a rubric, the performance training rubric. We know what the look fors are. In that three-day training, you watch four videos um, of just teaching in general, uh, lessons and so forth, and then pre-conferences and post-conferences. And that's designed so that you calibrate, so that when I walk out, I would evaluate the teacher similarly to how Judy would evaluate the teacher. So again, you need to calibrate if you're using um, rubrics for scoring consistency. And then the last thing is that the performances uh, are video recorded, so another teacher may double score selected performances. And in the um, frequently asked questions document that we're going to go through uh, right here before lunch, the new document that just came out on Friday, they even make a recommendation in the FAQ that um, Possibly, even you swap tests to have them graded for like your grade or post test. Like that might be something the district wants to consider. So that way, um, if there is any concern about um, just making sure that things are uh, legitimate and so forth, that um, you've traded tests with another teacher. So again, that's in the FAQ that just came out on Friday. Okay, growth targets. If we look at the choir example. <coughs> We notice that she has a minimum score of 70, and then from there the level of um, expectation increases. And then under her rationale for student growth, again, she's just recapping all of those things that she's already shared with us in her SLO. And that one item that I mentioned before that you would not have addressed about the school or district goal, she states in the very last paragraph, our school improvement plan is focused on using assessment data to inform instruction. The district music department has asked us to focus on authentic assessment of student performances. This SLO incorporates assessments that align with this departmental priority and the SLO process align with our school improvement plan. So that's how she kind of covered that fifth item on that checklist underneath rationale for student growth or for growth targets. So again, that's an example, and I'm going to show you some other examples on OBE's website. Um, so that way, if you want to see some science ones, and some of the examples that are on the website have annotations, meaning they're not exemplars, they're not like this uh, fire one. But what they've done is ODE has written feedback on them. So for instance, when our ESC received a grant last summer to pilot SLOs, we had to submit them to the State Department. And what the State Department did was they edited or wrote feedback on them and put some of them on the website. And I think that's very powerful because as we look at some of these, you can see that this is probably what your SLO is going to look like the first time you write it. It's kind of like the writing process. You write a draft, you get some feedback, you edit it, and then you go back and you finalize it. That's exactly what's going to occur when you write your SLO. So when you look at these examples that are on OB's website and you see the feedback, just make notes to yourself of, okay, I want to make sure that I either avoid that or that I cover that in my SLO um, and so forth. So I, I think it's really powerful. Questions about the choir example? You look at your growth targets where there are five tiers, mm -hmm. and then she broke it down whether uh, your baseline was 61 to 80 for 16 students. It says that they could have a minimum score of 75. So could you have a student that had a median of baseline of 75 on the post-test or whatever? No. And we're going to talk about that um, tomorrow morning, but since we're on it now, um, we, do you see where it says whichever is greater? So the minimum score of 75 or growth of 10 points, whichever is greater. So for that student that received an 80, they would have to get a growth of 10 points because that would be greater than the 75. And we're going to go through um, a section tomorrow morning where we're going to talk just about growth targets because the two areas on the SLO that have been, in our estimation, the most challenging have been writing growth targets and the assessments. And ODE is um, putting forth more and more information as they are working through the refinement um, process of the SLO um, itself. So tomorrow morning we'll go through some examples. <coughs> No, going from an 80 to a 75 would not be acceptable. A student has to show growth. 
and sustaining their score is not growth either. No, so if they have the 68 and they got the minimum score of 75, then they're all right. It's, like a 10 point it's whatever's greater. It's either they're going to get a 75. So for instance, in order to be at the minimum of 75 on that example, I would have to be at a 65 or below. Because if I'm um, 61 to 80 and the score is 75 or a growth of 10 points, whichever is greater. So if I got a 75 on my baseline or pre-assessment, then I have to have a growth of 10 points and be at 85. If I was a 68, <coughs> for instance, getting a 75 would only be a 7 point growth, but 10 points would be a greater growth. So that would be the greater of the two. So I have to get to 78. But if this becomes your pre-assessment for the next year, then if you're already, if you achieve or even come close to this, the next year everybody's going to be up around the 70s in your pre-assessment, right? Because the post the post-assessment becomes a pre-assessment for next year or something. Did you say you could use that sometimes? You could use the post-assessment as your baseline data and not do a pre-assessment in the fall if you choose so to. So then this is your baseline, so then you would have to, so if you're the choir four teacher, yeah. you would have everybody up in the 99 percentile if you achieve growth every year. And that could be, which in that case you might want to do a pre-assessment, you would still use that baseline data to help determine your growth targets for your students, but definitely. That would be something to think about long term. Good point. Other questions? Okay. Um, and while we're on it, I'm just going to show you those examples. Okay, do you remember how at the very beginning we went to OD's website? And I'll just do a quick recap of how we did that. Be a good teachable moment. Okay, I'm on the home page. I scroll down to the bottom. Remember where I go? What what words am I going to click on? Education. Educator evaluation. I click there. I get to the landing page, and I'm going to go over to student growth measures because that's where everything about student learning objectives resides. I can scroll there, or click on that. I scroll down, and if I keep going, I will see a link that says, Sample Student Learning Objectives Annotated by OBE. If I click on that, It will take me to examples that the Ohio Department of Education has annotated written feedback on them. They are adding to these um, subject areas over time. So when we click on the science one, there may be a few, but maybe not one for every grade level at this point. So that's why it's important to keep checking back. So we see we have an AP environmental science for grade 12. And there's a grade 7 science one. So we can look at the grade 7 science. That would probably be more applicable for today. And if you teach other subject areas like English language arts or social studies, you notice that there were other subject areas listed there too. You could go back and click on those for examples. But let's just take a look at this one. And you notice, what do you notice right off the bat? When you look at what the teacher has written, is there a lot of information in that baseline and training data box? No. For those of you that give an OAA or have been in a class that's given an OAA, that's one of the things we always tell the students. Write a lot, you know? Um, you want to write good information, but you do want to write a lot of information because, again, we're portraying a picture of our class. So this teacher wrote results of a pre-assessment that the SLO pilot group created. 
It is comprised of multiple choice and extended response questions. The scores are from 5% to 53%. Now based on just what we've already covered with the checklist and so forth, we had three things that we had to talk about. We had to have baseline data, trend data, and we had to analyze strengths and weaknesses. Do you think that the teachers covered that up here in this box? No. Just getting started, but again, when we practice writing these tomorrow, you will see it is a little bit of a challenge. It's not it's easier said than done. Um, what ODE has done is written feedback to, the, to this teacher, saying include more information about the source of data being utilized to inform the creation of the SLO. Include trend data if, if possible. If not, indicate that you don't have it. Identify students' strengths and weaknesses. Break the pre-assessment scores into ranges and state how many students score within each range. Which remember when we acquired one, I told you write a note about making a table because you're going to need to put that data in that box. Okay? So again, later on, I will let you just kind of get online and peruse and look at these different examples if you find them helpful. Great. If you don't, um, so be it or whatnot. But there are some uh, others, like I mentioned, for other subject areas. I know that you will hopefully be continuing, at least are expected to be continuing to be putting these back on. So again, you would just click on whichever subject area it is that you are interested in looking at examples. Okay. A couple other forms that you have in your packet today before we break for lunch. Um, you have a handout 1.6.
Okay, just take a moment. We'll just take uh, two minutes to just reflect about um, what components of the SLO with the elbow partner will be most difficult to complete. Which are you most comfortable, and what resources? Department recommends no more. 